Hey everyone, we're going to talk today about how to master your wrist conditions. Really important for that rotational golf swing we talk about using the hanger. So Henry, here I've, I've set up the hanger on my 7-iron, I think. And I set this, this hanger up a little different than most, or at least different than how it's designed. It's designed with the face on it. And I actually like to set the, fa the face sl slightly open mm -hmm. so that when I take my right hand grip, the hanger just rests right on my right forearm. Okay, so that allows me to be able to hinge my wrists how I like my wrists to hinge. I like my, most of the hinge is actually extension. And that extension causes the hanger to go to the other arm. So it goes from right arm at address to left arm. That's a really important thing, learning how to put the extension into our trail wrist. Yeah, and this, like you just said, you set it up a little bit differently than maybe some other people set it up. So I, I want to just go back to that point. So you set it a little open so you can get that wrist to go into extension, something we talk about all the time, right? Yeah, so I set it open so I can get my trail wrist into extension, not really a radial hinge. So I want to see more of an extension Yep. type hinge like this than I do a vertical hinge. Something I think a lot of people at home think when they hinge the club that it's like that right there, right? Yeah, and that's it was taught for a long time. I taught it for a long time, but I've d decided that it's not actually what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. We might hinge it vertic. A lot of players might hinge it vertically in their backswing, but it converts into more of an extension. And so I'm more along, I I'd rather teach it that it goes into extension right away yep. or earlier. So it's not as much this as it is this. And like we've talked about before, we have a video too on sort of like different takeaways, right? Some three different takeaways we've seen. We've seen a kind of an early hinge, a one piece, and actually a, a later hinge. So by you having it on the right forearm, you can actually do all three of those. Yeah, yeah, right? I, could, I could have almost no hinge going the other way and then hinging. I could have an early hinge or I could have something in the middle where it's kind of one piece and then hinging. Yeah, and when that hinge happens, now this little rod here, the curve of this hanger, starts to ride up your for your left forearm. It goes onto the left forearm and, and it flattens my left wrist out. Flattens the ref left wrist out. Yep. Do we need a lot of bow in that lead wrist when that happens? No. No, okay. you, all you need to do is add in the extension in the trail wrist and that takes my left wrist from kind of an extended position and flattens it out, and that puts the the rail right on my, my left arm. Yeah. So I think one important key here is that as we talk about these wrist conditions, and you hear all the time about matchups, right? So the grip plays a role in, in what's going on here, but overall, we still want the wrist to be moving in this fashion, right? We don't need too much of this, and you don't need too much of this, unless maybe you have a little bit of that set up. But, Theoretically, even if you had a weaker grip, it would still move this way. It would just be a little more bowed, yeah, like so we talked about. I could put my hand on in a weak fashion. And now as I swing it back to get it onto my forearm, you can see my left wrist is now kind of bowed. Yeah. And that's just the relationship between my right and left is instead of having my left hand on strong, my left hand's on weaker, but my right hand's kind of in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And that's generally what we see on tours. Most people's right hands are fairly similar. There are there's some variation, but it's not that drastic. But the left hands, yeah, they vary quite a lot. I there's guys whose left hands on like this, <laughs> and guys whose left hands on like this. Yeah. So you know it's, but the right hand generally matches more or less the face. It, small amounts, but not like you don't see anybody with the right hand under or really over. Yep. Cool. All right, so we've kind of made our way through the takeaway here. Let's go up to like P3, P4, towards the top of our swing. So now we're here at three and four. If my wrists work correctly, you can see that this club face more or less matches my left arm. Right? And your wrist is probably close to its max state, just before. My right wrist is more or less maxed out, and it might go just a little bit more right in the transition. Yeah where it gives me just a little bit of additional extension. Now one great thing I, I feel like happens with this club too, or the hanger I should say, is once you get to the top, 
as long as you don't fight it, you kind of, you kind of, it's in its position, it's on your left forearm, and if anything, it keeps working back away from you a little bit. It that face is super stable if you just turn in the corner. Oh yeah. When I change directions, I feel like the hanger actually is squishing against my forearm pretty good. Yeah. And then I feel like it just stays there, and I don't even. There's not a whole lot happening through here. Yep. Just stable. And it's hard, I, I will say it's hard the first few swings to really get that because you're inclined to want to release a little bit or want to roll a little bit, whatever way you've kind of squared the face up in the past, right? But if you can just give it a second and learn to go slow and allow that club to come back to the ball, that thing's going to be more square than you've ever had. Yep. It gets square early, and it doesn't require a lot of manipulation late. Cool. So right, shall well. I hit one for everybody? Yeah, let's hit a few here. Okay, so I'm gonna hit some. I'm gonna start off small. We know how much warm up I've had so far today. Just a little chip shot like that, and that one leaked a little to the right, but still pretty good. I find if there is a tendency with this training aid. It is to miss it a little right, yeah. right? Because the face is, you may be just, if, assume you don't turn it over and close it on purpose, you know, that, that face should be hung out a little bit to the right. That's pretty nice right there. That one's pretty straight. And you'll see that club face was just... Yeah, you probably felt like it's like here, and then just boom. Yeah. There's no play to be able to get yeah. it to two. I probably have a little bit of this in my golf swing, and I there's it's blocked. So yeah. that's why I can't get it to turn over. Right. But it really helps me feel how to get my wrist set correctly. And, you know, again, when we do these, any of these videos, when we bring in a tool or training it, um, yes, we vetted them, and we... We use them in our lessons, but the importance of going slow, exaggerating the motion, reducing your expectations, right? Bring them down to earth so you, you can get away with hitting a shank, thinning it, topping it, chunking it. It's okay. Get the motion right. The idea is it's supposed to be a guide that helps you feel how to move a little different. Right. Not necessarily how to hit it perfect. I mean, if I was a student of yours, Milo, I showed up for my first lesson, my wrist conditions were all out of whack. And you're like, let's let's put you in the hangar for a second. And the first one I shank like, you know, dead right. I mean, what are you telling me? Nothing. I just say, that's all right. Let's do it again. There you go. I don't I don't try to fix it. Right. I let you I let you figure out how to move a little bit different and a little bit better to be able to deliver the club a new way. And it takes time.